Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We believe at Deep Adventure Ministries that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. So we invite you, women, go grab your men and say, listen to this. This is really cool stuff. Fathers, grab your sons and say, come listen to this with me. We have more and more fathers and sons listening to this show together. If you message me on Facebook and you're listening to the show as a father and a son, uh, we might send you a gift of one of my books. So message me because we really just dig on that when you guys do that. I've been thinking lately, I've been talking with Kevin Phillip from Regina, Canada, where I'll be speaking in September. He has a group of 75 people that have been attending a conference there. And I told him, no, we got to break the threshold. We need 300 men to come. And, and, I, and then it occurred to me, let's call it the 300. Because I've been to Thermopylae, Greece, where they uh, ran a lot of marathons, by the way. I've actually been to Olympia, too, where the Olympic Games were. But in Thermopylae, it's famous because of the 300 Spartans that stepped into the breach to, uh, to resist uh, an enemy that was attacking. Uh, it also reminds me of Gideon's army, the 300. Do you remember when God uh, called Gideon to fight? Um, he went down by the river uh, ready to fight. He said, oh, you got way too many men. Uh, tell the men, anybody who feels a little bit worried, they got a sick mother at home or they're kind of a little bit scared, go home. And so a bunch of them left. And he said, you still got too many men. If you win this battle, you're going to take credit for it yourself. So everybody go down to the river and every man that I believe looks down and laps the water like a dog, send them home. But if they scoop it up in, the, in their hand and they lick it out of, drink it out of the palm of their hand, keep those men. It's kind of like... The men who would reach down and scoop up that water with their hand and drink it, they would be able to keep their eye uh, on the ridge line to see if the enemy was coming. Huh? They would be alert. Anyone who would reach down and start drinking it right out of the water, they wouldn't be able to see an enemy approaching. So he, he, he narrowed it down to these 300 men that he knew would be uh, more alert and more, uh, more ready, more, uh, uh, more able as warriors. And he fought that fight with the 300 and they had a great victory. And so it's time for us to be among the 300, to step into the breach and to stand our ground. The breach in the wall is running right through your living rooms. We need to start right there by teaching our children solid Catholic teaching, doctrinal and moral teaching. We need to, uh, we need to pray with them. They need to see us pray. They need to wake up in the morning and see that their dad is already sitting in his favorite chair and having his prayer time with the Lord or was taking them to Mass every Sunday. We need men to step into the breach. We have such a man as that with us today, Patrick Novakowski. Patrick, welcome to our show. Great to be with you again, Bear. This is your second time on our show. That's really unusual, you know. I, 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 it's a great honor, buddy. Well, most people wouldn't come back right after the first time they've been on our show, but we're glad you're here. But I, I just, uh, really confuses me why anybody would want to run marathons. Well, I, I, because I was too poor to join a gym. I, I had enough money for a pair of shoes, but not enough money to join a gym. So when I was in my early thirties, I, I strapped on a pair of shoes and I ran a mile and I got sweaty and, and it became a, an addiction. Well, uh, I, it, it, all it, I know is that really, joining a gym now is less expensive than buying sh some of those sh shoes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some of my shoes are about a, a, a month's worth of gym membership. That's for sure. <laughs> and, and as much as I run, I, I burn through two pairs of shoes a year. Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. So, yeah. uh, so it's there's something beautiful though about running. Uh, there's that. Um, the endorphins that kick in, you know, they're, they're God's, it's God's high. It's what God, how God rewards absolutely. you for taking good the care natural, of your body. The natural eye. Absolutely. You know, I had been uh, unable to surf for two or three weeks. And so this weekend I paddled out in a little bit bigger. It wasn't really that big, but it was like walls of water it was hard to break through. And I was a little bit winded at first. I'm like, I'm not used to being uh, winded when I stand up paddling, going out to surf. But after two or three or four minutes, the uh, the blood started to flow and the energy kicked in and and uh, that's part of it, isn't it? There's that kind of initial part of your run where you just don't feel it. Yeah, yeah. And the, the other thing is that if you if you stop for a while, stop for a few weeks, then you've got to build up again. 
and and there are some parallels there in the spiritual life. If you, if you stop praying or you stop going to church, you start you you stop your your communion with God, then then there's kind of a a restart that you need to 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 get into in order to build up the the, the strength that you had before. It's so true. You know, like when I, it's really true. We, one of our guys, Tony Orband in Long Ride Home, he has a patch on his vest that says seven days without prayer makes you weak. It's really one day without prayer, you know, yeah. makes you weak. If we don't live that spiritual life every day, I know, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a distance athlete. I've paddled my canoe f- across the Molokai Channel. It's about 27 miles, real treacherous sea between the island of Molokai and Oahu. And I pedal my bicycle across the United States. Um, I'm really not very fast, so I have to be a distance <laughs> athlete. But there is something about that. Um, there is something about those first 10 minutes when you don't, you're maybe not feeling it, and then yeah. the blood starts to flow. And that's yeah, yeah. really true in our, in our prayer life, isn't it? No, absolutely. And, and the closer you get to the finish, uh, at least for distance athletes like us, the closer you get to the goal, the more strength you have. My, my last mile is always my fastest. That's really cool. Well, I know for me, like uh, when I when I was pedaling my bicycle, I was really good. We we do about eighty five to one hundred miles a day, and I just remember on the bicycle course. But I just remember, I was really good uh, on the eighty fifth and eighty sixth mile. But the eighty seventh mile, I was done. I mean, when I I had set one, you set that goal, and when you get to that distance, the mile after that is is the last mile is good. But if you go one more mile, it's like I uh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, it's kind of pushing it a little bit too far. Yeah, uh, what's yeah. your what's your funnest marathon you've run? Funnest marathon. Wow. Um, my first marathon that I, I ever ran was the, the conclave that elected Pope Francis. I was in Rome as, uh, as a journalist. So this is seven years ago. Um, Pope Francis coming up on seven years being elected. Um, I've, I heard there was a marathon. I had just run two half marathons and I had never run a full marathon. And I thought, what the heck? I'm in Rome. I've got my running clothes. There's a marathon. My longest run in my life was 13.1 miles, but I was going to double it that day. So I signed up on Friday. I ran it on Sunday, and I flew home on Monday. But what was it like? Where, where did the where did the route take you? It must have been really it, it cool. Was, it was. The, the thing is, because there was the conclave, they routed it away from the Vatican. Mm-hmm. But uh, the second marathon I ran was on John Paul's canonization weekend. Mm. And and. And that was exhilarating because we went right past the Vatican. I, you know, yes, me my funnest marathon. My funnest was probably my first New York City marathon because two years ago, because the there are one million people that come out to cheer people on at the oh New York. Oh my goodness! Marathon. The yeah. energy of Brooklyn is extraordinary. I bet half the people that come out are in Brooklyn. Well, you and, know that. Mm-hmm. And and there's this tradition: you put your name across your chest. And uh, in tape, you write it on there, and, and and people yell out your name. So by the time I finished my 26th mile, I probably had a thousand people yelling out my name. And they you didn't really... even you didn't even owe the money. Exactly. Yeah, that's amazing. So hey, it, it brings it out the best in New York too, which is really exciting. But it reminds me of like when you're in where you, when you're running through if you're in the Vatican, right in the 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 the, the plaza there the great crowd of witnesses that are cheering us on, you know, all those incredible yeah. statues that are, that are, are the two arms that are reaching out as you, as you walk in. The, uh, it's just so powerful. The cloud of witnesses that cheers for us, that prays yes. for us, you know, as Catholics, when you were in Rome, did you get, did, I'm curious, maybe on the second one, they did it more, but what are there seven Hills in Rome, right? I mean, did they, did you go up every Hill or, you know, it wasn't very hilly. It was relatively flat. You start at the Colosseum, you wind down uh, up the Tiber, you go past the Vatican, and then you come back on the other side of the Tiber. So it's it's really along the river, pr- mm. pretty much. And then you get all the best monuments in the last three, four miles. Do, do you is, ever go outside the walls or no? Uh, outside the walls of Rome? You know, St. Paul outside the walls is right near the beginning of the race. So, oh, that's yeah. so cool, man. Yeah. He, Patrick Novakowski is the coolest guy we've ever had on our show. <laughs> No, that's just so cool. And, and But there is something about, you know, Paul was an amazing athlete. I mean, anybody that did what he did, I mean, he was shipwrecked how many times, but, uh, and he would talk to young Timothy about, you know, uh, training like an athlete for Christ. He he said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. You know, he, he was on a, he was definitely on a marathon. There's something about a marathon though, that you, you train yourself for it and you pace yourself. 
Uh, Jeff Cavins, I keep talking about Jeff uh, the last few days. Jeff uh, has the saying that you could tell where someone's heart is by the rhythm of their life, by the rhythm of their week, by the rhythm of their day. There's a certain rhythm in a, in a marathoner's life, and there needs to be that same sort of rhythm in a, in a Christian's life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you start a marathon. You, you don't give your biggest push at the beginning. You save that for the end. You know your pace. You keep your pace. You hold your pace. And, and you have to have trained well in order to finish. So even though my first marathon, I didn't train at all for it. I just did it because it was there. But yeah, you keep a rhythm and, and you, you, you keep your pace and, um, and, and you know where the finish line is and, and you just go for it. And that's what we need to do. And uh, as Christians, you know, when ra- rainy days or, or good days, you know, when there's, uh, there's ups and downs in life, but you just stay the course. You, stay the you, course. Know, you, you put one foot in front of the other. I remember my ninja sensei, he said, you can do one more push up. You can do one more of anything. You can do one more pedal stroke. You can make one more stride. You can do one more paddle, you know, with a, with a canoe or, with, or, or surfing. You can do one more of anything. The thing is, is just to do it. Just one, one at a time. Anyone that's facing right now a great, a need for a great deal of the virtue of fortitude, just do one more. Do one more day. Do one more breath, and God will bless you. We're talking with Patrick Novakoski, and your website is? Novamedia.us. Novamedia.us. We'll be right back to talk about his new book. Hey man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Plus, good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our co-adventure guide today is Patrick Novakowski. I just really love this guy. He was such an encouragement to me. And as I began to uh, do, uh, he was one of my first guests on my radio show. I think within the first six months or so, he was one of my original guests and was just such an encouragement to me. And so I, it's been a while since I've had him on my, on my show. So I have a good excuse because of his new book, uh, the 100 Ways uh, John Paul II Changed the World. Tell us about, Patrick, tell us about your love for John Paul II and how this all came to be, the book. Well, gosh, um, my, my first experience of John Paul was actually in a vivid dream that I had when I was 16 years old. In 1984, John Paul became the first pope ever to visit Canada. And um, it was wall-to-wall coverage. I mean, the, the, the Pope coming to Canada was an unprecedented event. Um, and so somewhere in that course of, of, of 10, 11 days that he was in Canada, um, I had this really vivid dream that he came to our house, that he was in my room, and he gave me this really warm, beautiful hug. Like my, my father always gave me these big bear hugs, for lack of a better term. And I got this hug from John Paul II. Now, I was no holy roller. I didn't even see John Paul II. I I went to church every Sunday. I went to confession when my parents told me to. But um, I didn't have really a relationship with 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 Christ or the church at that time. That was it was more than just, you know, a Sunday Catholic. So the fact that I had this very vivid dream was really extraordinary. And whenever I give my talk about John Paul, um, I, usually about every third time, someone will step, put their hand up and say, I had a dream just like that. Really? So I'm not, I'm not alone in people having these um, experiences of John Paul that are either in dreams or in prayer that are, mm. are so powerful. Um, so um, that was when I was 16. When I was 28, uh, I started working for the Marian Fathers, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And it was Christmas of 1986. 
um, I won a prize at, at their Christmas raffle. I won a trip for two to Cancun. So I called what? the travel. Yeah, I won a trip for two to Cancun. I didn't pull my name out of a hat. Um, but the thing is, I didn't want to sit in on a beach in Mexico. I wanted to go to Rome. So I called the travel agent. I said, can I trade my ticket in and go to Rome instead? They said, absolutely. So um, I called my family, my friends, and said, I'm going to Rome. Anybody want to come with me? My brother did. One of my brothers, he saved up his money. September of 19... No, sorry. Yeah, 1997. The 90s, back in the 90s. September of 97, I went to Rome for the first time. And matter of fact, most of your view viewers, listeners, probably know Father Don Calloway. Oh, I love Don. At the, time, yeah. at the time, he was brother Don Calloway. We were in Rome together. No and, kidding. And we were supposed to see the Pope together, but he got sick oh. and, and he couldn't go. So it was October 1st, 1997, the first time I saw John Paul II. So the Marians are a Polish order of priests and brothers. Uh, they, they, they had a really great relationship with John Paul II. And because I was working for them, I was in Rome, they said, well, we'll, we'll try to get you on the list to see the Holy Father. And I said, Yes, put me on that list, please. So it actually happened. I, I, I had this. I, so how, how it works is John Paul would have private mass every morning around 7, 730. And, and if there were seats left over that weren't taken up by bishops, then and, and you were on the list, then they would they would call you the night before and say, you know, please come to the bronze door at the, uh, the Vatican uh, at 630 and we'll will get you into the, the mass with the Pope, which was what happened. And I, I'm, I'm shortening the story because I, when I tell this story, it, it, I can stretch it out for an hour because it was so amazing. But long story short, my brother and I, we arrived early. We, we got led up this flight of stairs through a courtyard, through another flight of stairs. And we're in this, this waiting room. And uh, then Bishop Jeevish, now Cardinal Jeevish, the Pope's uh, personal assistant, led us into, into the Pope's chapel. He was kneeling there alone, mm. praying in front of the tabernacle in his private chapel, the first time I God. laid eyes on John Paul II. Oh, my and literally, goodness. literally, my heart jumped in my chest. It was, oh, it was my a goodness. physical... I felt something change in me when that happened, when I, when I mm. saw him for the first time. Mm. And... So we, 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 we filed in, there were about 30 seats. So it was a very intimate uh, mass. Um, the, the, the Holy Father celebrated the mass. Uh, he didn't distribute communion, so I didn't receive communion from him, but, um, but had the mass with him. And I stared at him the whole time. My eyes did not leave the man. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was terribly exciting. Uh, and then the, after mass, they led us out into the, the waiting room I was the only person that day that had a gift for him. My brother was with me, but we also had uh, about ten, ten, about eight or ten Polish seminarians who who were a part of this group that we we formed kind of a an oval. Um, and he came up to each one of us. Now I was a little bit nervous because <laughs> I, was I would guess prepared, so. I was twenty twenty nine years old. I had this little prepared speech that I was going to give. I was showing him pages from Marion.org. I was the, the webmaster of Marion.org at the time. And I showed him pages of, of uh, Divine Mercy and, and uh, blessed, then Blessed Faustina and things that he had done and said about Divine Mercy. And so I had that all prepared. I had my talk prepared, but I, I, was, I was shaking. I was nervous. Then he entered the room. All that nervousness is gone. In an mm. instant, it was gone. Um, and, and it was like I was with my dad. I mean, it was just that comfortable. Mm. Um, so I opened the folder. I said, Holy Father, this is what I'm showing you. And he said, thank you. He put a rosary in my hand. And I had about 60 seconds. The, 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 the greatest pope of the last thousand years by my side. I spoke. He listened. He gave me a rosary. It was I was on cloud nine for a year after that. Um, and then the Marians uh, sent me to Eastern Europe to write about the, the, the work that they were doing because John Paul had asked them to help lead the re-evangelization of Eastern Europe after the fall of communism, or late 90s. And, um, and my, my articles that I wrote raised a lot of money for, for their work. Mm. 
Mm. So in 98, they sent me back to Rome again and then back to Eastern Europe. 99, I came to Europe again. I saw John Paul in Poland. Um, mm. It was a different setting. He was there to to bless a shrine that the Marian Fathers had built. Um, and and it, it was me and about 150 priests, brothers, and seminarians with John Paul. I was one of the only In his homeland. There. In his homeland in wow. central Poland. Um, I came back in 2000 when he was can, he was canonizing uh, Faustina, uh, April of 2000, the first saint of the new millennium, Saint Faustina. I was at her canonization, and I saw John Paul while I was there. And then I left. I met my wife, uh, and she lived in Michigan. So I moved to Michigan and had broke that connection with the Marians, so I wasn't working for them anymore, wasn't going to Rome to see the Pope every year. But every time I went to Rome... I, I would see the Pope blessing newlyweds mm -hmm. in, yeah, that's... in his, his Wednesday audience in St. Right. Peter's Square. And I said to myself, I want that. I want that uh, for me and for the, the woman that I'll marry. So when I met Michelle, I didn't tell her that, but she knew I'd met the Pope. And she had several friends that had gone to Rome and had, their, had been blessed by the Pope uh, in their wedding clothes. And so she brought it up. She said, hey, if we get married, wouldn't it be great to go to Rome and get blessed by the Pope? And I had made a vow that I wasn't going to marry someone unless she wanted that. Wow. And, and she brought that so up. She brought that up. So that was that was the icing on the cake. It's beautiful. So, I, I've, I've been there, um, you know, during the public audience and I, I got within three three of the of the front row. Yeah. You know, we didn't quite get to shake the Pope's hand, but. Just off to the right, just a few chairs away, were those hundreds uh, of, of couples that had just gotten married. And yeah. for them all to receive the papal blessing. We're talking with Patrick Novakowski. Um, you know, it's, so, it's kind of sad that he's so boring and so unenthusiastic <laughs> about his faith. Uh, your website is novamedia.us. Yes. And we're gonna, when we get back, we're going to dig into um, his new book, 100 ways that John Paul II changed the world. You know, the Catholic Church has is really the reason why we have a Western civilization in the first place. And we've really been blessed by um, the writings of John Paul II, a dramatic uh, impact on my life, um, the, his writings. You know, not only, not only a great, deeply spiritual man and great with Marian devotion, but also deep, deep, uh, uh, brilliant uh, philosophically and and uh, things like that, his theology of the body, his writings on the theology of the body, just so powerful too. So when we come back, we're going to dig a little bit deeper, see if we can get Patrick a little bit more uh, enthusiastic about <laughs> John Paul II. We'll be right back. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We have as our co-adventure guide today, Patrick Novakowski, novamedia.us, the author of the new book, 100 Ways That John Paul II Changed the World. Uh, I know he radically changed Patrick's life. You were saying that you, you, uh, you went to um, Rome, I believe, on your honeymoon. Is that right? Yes, yes. So we went to Rome on our honeymoon. We, we knelt in front of John Paul II, and he blessed us 11 days after we got married. And, and everything just flowed from that moment in, in our married life. It was, it was kind of the, the, the best way to kick off our, our married life. Um, and, and everything flowed from that. And so, so then how did you get inspired to write the book? Well, the, the talk, actually my book developed from a talk that I've been giving for several years on John Paul's influence. First of all, how I met him, how that, that whole, whole, whole story of, John Paul and I uh, unfolded, and uh, and then I needed a little bit more substance to it, so I, I, I developed the talk into his top ten gifts to the world, and that uh, I pitched that as a book because I thought it was a neat story. How I met the Pope, you know, winning a, a, a drawing and going to Rome and meeting him five times, and the the, the, the publishers didn't think there was quite enough there. 
So I thought about this over a number of years and talked to a number of Catholic publishers. And then it occurred to me that 2020 is going to be the anniversary of his birth. He'll, he will he would have been 100 years old on May 18th, 2020, which is coming up very close. So last summer, um, I, I had some time to write. I had um, several ideas for a book. And I chose this one simply because there, there are so many things coming up in 2020 about John Paul. Uh, the book is actually out April 2nd, which is 15 years to the day that he died. It's uh, it's about six weeks before his 100th birthday. So that was uh, kind of the impetus to drive me to develop this talk into 100 ways that he changed the world. Well, give us some of the top ways that come to mind. Well, some of the top ways. Uh, world Youth Day. He founded World Youth Day. Uh, in the early 80s, um, he had a meeting with youth in Paris in, in the early, early 80s. I want to say it was 82, somewhere in there. And it was such a great success. So he thought about this and thought, you know, there's something here. There's something in the youth that really is untapped. And so in 1984, he held the first World Youth Day and it became um, – it, it, it grew into what it is today, picked up by his successors, um, Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Um, and thousands of youth have come to Christ at these these World Youth Day. Uh, it's not just a day anymore, right? It's, it's a whole week uh, where the Pope comes at the end and there's great excitement for the faith, for the Holy Father. Uh, and, and great fruit has come from that. We see that in Denver with the Augustine Institute and Focus. Denver's really become a hub of Catholicism in, in the United States and spilling out in, across the whole world. Okay, so, what's an, yeah, give us another one. That, another one? Well, theology of the body. Uh, absolutely. One of his, his, his foremost theological teachings is uh, theology of the body. One of the first major teachings of his pontificate, too, it comes from, I want to say, 130 talks that he gave in his Wednesday audience starting in uh, the, the, the late 70s. So just a few years into his pontificate, he started every Wednesday to talk about the body, the human body, and how it helps us to understand who God is, helps us understand who we are as human persons. Um, it, it puts sex, human sexuality into context of, of how God created us and, and, and who God is. Uh, there's a lot of confusion in the world today, gender confusion, gender ideology. Pope Francis says it's demonic. Gender ideology is demonic. But, it, you know, John Paul taught that we can understand who we are and what our sexuality is and should be by, by just how we're created, our physical bodies. And so that's theology of the body. There's so much more to it. That, 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 that's yeah. just kind of a snapshot. It's a, so the that's first, one. The first book uh, my wife and I read together. Uh, when we were just getting to know each other was Christopher West, one of Christopher West's book. And he does such a great job of distilling that teaching down so people like I can kind of understand it. Yeah. But it's just just great, uh, the theology of the body. I remember I read um, all 130 of those homilies, and um, and then I read Christopher West's book, and I go, oh, okay, now I understand. Yeah, now that. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> what, I highly recommend it. Absolutely. Uh, what's another area? Well, another, uh, another one, way? Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Oh, Yes. You know, the, the, the last full catechism was written about a thousand years ago. Uh, the, Rome, the Rome Catechism, I think it was called, the, the Universal Catechism. So a Universal Catechism comes from the Vatican. It, it, it shows us what we believe and why. Uh, no, and the thing about the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is that no other faith has such a comprehensive written um, a book that that teaches what we believe and why. The, the, there is no other faith that does that. Yeah, there, so, there's there's such a history of the catechism. You know, I'm, I teach from the catechism every morning. Uh, my Ocean Sunrise Catechism. Yeah. If you guys want to follow me, uh, uh, Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure, that page. Uh, we pop on every day at 7 a.m. Uh, wherever Bear happens to be, 7 a.m. time. Sometimes that's uh, East Coast time or it might be Rome or it might be uh, Hawaii, but every every morning at 7 a.m., we and we've gone through the entire catechism once, and we're starting over again now. So we read, and I I give I share some insights 
uh, kind of the unique bear way of looking at things. And then we have a kind of a, a tribe that forms. There's, there's a community there because people who, who are listening also participate and, and make comments and pray for each other. So it's been a unique thing. But the catechism to me is what a gift when, when, when that was, uh, I, I guess it was, he assigned Pope Benedict, right, to kind of head up. Yeah, so Pope Benedict was one of the key drivers of, of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and, uh, and, and through the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Um, so now rich. There are a lot, you know, under, it, interestingly, there are a lot of bishops that said, Holy Father, we don't need a catechism. It's a modern era. And, and he pushed back and said, no, we do. And the faithful responded by making it an international bestseller. <laughs> it, it, I mean, this is a book... That that you don't read this as a novel, right? I mean, it's 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 kind of detailed. You should read it. Uh, yeah, go. Ahead, I'm sorry. It, it's something you read in bits and pieces. Right. But it became an international bestseller in English, in French, in Spanish, in well, Portuguese. The history of the catechism is going back to the Didache, right? Around the year 70 AD, the little short little booklet that 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 they would teach people who wanted to be uh, catechized. And then you saw different different versions of it. The the the, the Council of Trent came out with the catechism as response to the Reformation. And then the Baltimore Catechism as well. But those catechisms were written, even the Baltimore Catechisms, there are different levels of it, different versions of it. Um, addressing it to different people. But the catechisms back, like the, the Council of Trent, was written so that priests could take that and teach their flock because there were a lot of people that weren't going to have a book, right, that exactly. couldn't even read. But this catechism now is the first time where this is a catechism for everyone to read. And guess what? If it's chewy, you bet. If You, yeah. need, you know, we're, we're done having pablum. You know, we want to eat meat. I always tell priest you should be teaching right out of the catechism on your on your sunday homilies give your people meat stop telling them just to be nice to one another you know but read the catechism is so rich and so deep and yeah it's over your head so dig a little deeper i, I always yeah. have to have my iphone there so i can look up words you know <laughs> things like that so i know or whatever the saint they're quoting a saint they're quoting scripture so i can look it up but it's a wonderful gift What's the next thing that, that John Paul II gave to well, them? Well, John Paul was a Marian pope. His, his motto was totus tuus. So his devotion to Our Lady, um, he had, he had a, a Marian year during his, his pontificate. Um, he had great devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. Of course, he, he credits Our Lady of Fatima with saving his life when the assassination attempt happened in 1981. So his devotion to Mary, I think, really spurred a lot of people to think about Mary in a different way. It also was a great sign to the world that the church doesn't worship Mary. The Catholic Church doesn't worship Mary. We honor Mary. And, and you can't outdo Jesus in honoring Mary. Amen. So. Um, he kind of put Mary on a pedestal, well, although she already was on a pedestal. Well, I remember, Patrick, when, when I, was, uh, I was away from the church, it was almost like people say, you fell away from the church. I go, no, the church fell away from me. I was hungry. I, was, I wanted to know more, and I wasn't, I wasn't being catechized. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, it was before the catechism, I guess, came out, but I had no idea about the early church fathers and, and all this great writing. And Mary always confused me. <clears throat> so I was surfing in France in Beirut at a contest. I'd surf there every year. And I said, you know, I'm going to go over to Lourdes. But I better go over there now because if I wait for a week, the Pope's going to show up. It'll be too crowded. That's my mentality back then. But I went to Lourdes, and uh, and from that moment I went to Lourdes, uh, the mystery of Mary began to be unlocked for me. And I'm sure um, John Paul II being there, the great graces that came out of there were part of that. But, yeah, so he was a Marian uh, Pope. He, the devotion... His love for Mary. In fact, one of the things I like to do, I think it's the Universalis app, or maybe it's Laudate, has the Pope uh, praying the rosary in Latin, and you can pray along ah. with him. And there's just something special about his voice, the devotion of it. We're talking to Patrick Novakowski. He is the author of the book, 100 Ways John Paul II Changed the World. Uh, his, his website's novamedia.us. We're going to come right back and talk about a few more of those ways. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron 
If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure at Deep Adventure Ministries. There's so much going on. When we had our new web designer work on our deepadventure.com website, they go, there's, there's just too much here. I mean, we, there, there's just too much going on. How are we going to communicate all of this? But we think we've done a really good job. Fuzadi helped us out. They, put together, they helped us with a, with a new website along with uh, uh, a Kickstart Media. And we were able to uh, put together something that kind of shows you all the different elements of our ministry. Bear's Man Cave. If, you, if you're a man, uh, jo consider joining Bear's Man Cave. Go to our website, click on it. You become a part. You have to go to our website to join, but you become a part of a secret Facebook group where the men challenge and equip and mobilize and share with one another. We get together every three weeks or so on a live video chat too, so it's pretty cool stuff. You can go there. You can if you be, if you go there, you can click and become a Patreon donor. If you become a twenty dollar a month donor, really cool stuff happens. Our our Patreon uh, link is Patreon dot com forward slash bear Wozniak deep adventure or you can just go to deepadventure.com and find it but when you join at that level you actually get to have the, the this radio show you know is actually we have a youtube video version of it and we'll send it to you weeks before it's broadcast on the ewtn network the other thing is you know our long ride home um tv show we're uh we're right now working on season three the me members who, who who donate at that level they're already getting to watch season three uh, it automatically comes to them as soon as we do the director's cut. Uh, others may not see it on EW10 or on the Armed Forces Network, or there too, may not see it for six or seven or eight months uh, after our Patreon donors get to see it too. Plus, you get all seasons passed to all of Long Ride Home, plus all kinds of other cool stuff. So go to our website, find out about the Ocean Sunrise Catechism, find out about uh, Bear's Man Cave, find out about our store. We have got the best, I think, store that there is. We have the coolest stuff in our store along with my books. There's a lot of other cool t-shirts and uh, St. Benedict exorcism rings. I mean, there's so many cool stuff there. Um, so go to our website or you're never going to figure out what we're all about if you don't if you don't get there. We're talking with Patrick Novakowski, the author of a new book, The 100 Ways John Paul II uh, Changed the World. And I know he wrote that book because John Paul II had a radical because of him, there was a radical changes in Patrick's life too. So Patrick, tell us uh, one more area that, one more way that he changed the world. Yeah, just before the break, we were talking about how he, how John Paul is a Marian Pope. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, you know, I, it's been a while since I wrote the book, so I, I might yeah, my, I get my, that. <laughs> the, the years might not be quite right here, but um, I want to say about ten. No, no, gosh, he's been dead fifteen years. About twenty years ago maybe 22 years ago, John Paul wrote a letter about the rosary. And in the letter, he proposed five new mysteries for the rosary. Amen. So we know the rosary is, is, is the, the, um, the joyful mysteries, um, you know, Jesus' birth. Uh, and, and then there's a bit of a gap and you jump into the, the sorrowful mysteries and then the, the glorious mysteries. But between the, you know, finding Jesus in the temple and the the uh, agony in the garden, there's a big gap there. And I think everyone knew this. Uh, but John Paul said, hey, you know what? We, we need to fill that gap w with a meditation on the life of Christ, uh, the, the actual work of Christ, the ministry of Christ. So in his letter, he, he proposed these five new mysteries, which we now know as the luminous mysteries, the mysteries of light. He didn't impose them on the church. He said, I've got this idea. I think this is, is, is a good idea. What do y'all think? And everyone who prayed the rosary and read his letter went, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. We've been missing this for a thousand years, and you filled in that gap, Holy Father. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, lo I love the rosary. You know, the, the, uh, for me, the rosary is when I want, I'm praying for someone to become a convert, I pray the rosary. If I'm going into battle, I pray the rosary. I, I know you probably are aware of this, but you know there's a hundred in the original the, the rosary. There's a, if you pray it through the three times the original rosary, you pray 153 hail marys, which is the same amount as the fish that uh, they counted when when Jesus said throw your net out on the other side. It's a great wow. fishing net. The the rosary. I I I I I'm still I, I've been reading a lot about Mary these days. I read Father Don Calloway's two of his books. One on one is, uh, the, uh, I think, a summary based on the theology of the body. 
and then also his uh, a couple of his other books. I got to be with him in, in Israel, by the way, too. You mentioned him earlier. Yeah. But, um, but the rosary, for me, is this great weapon, as Padre Peel called it. When I need to go to battle, I, I, I never knew how to really enter into intercessory prayer until I picked up the rosary. But now uh, in meditating on, on these different books and really taking the time aside this year to study uh, Mary, I've just read a whole book on what the early church fathers wrote about the whole, the whole uh, through the through the church, the writings uh, of the early church fathers about Mary, and I'm just really falling more and more in love with her uh, as Our Lady, you know. And mm. uh, so, yeah. So, tell us more. But yeah, what's John, John Paul just had had such a great devotion to the Rosary, and and you you were talking earlier about praying the Rosary in Latin with the mm. Holy Father. Um, one, some of the, the the best pictures you'll see him in prayer, but also you know like this clutching yes. the rosary in his yes. fist. Yeah, and and um, so the the praying the rosary with John Paul the the luminous mysteries big one. Um, let me jump right to the the top one. Okay, I'm, what's the t- we can talk about this for a while. So when I was coming up with with a list of the top ten gifts that John Paul II gave the world, um, I, I consulted with with. My, my friends, with, with people who had written about John Paul II, um, people like George Weigel. I, I had a conversation. George with Weigel's him. your friend? Yeah, yeah. We, we Dude, text back and forth. Uh, you text uh, George Weigel? Yeah. So it's funny. Dude, you are one lucky I, guy. <laughs> there are times where, where I'm giving this John Paul talk and people will ask me a question I don't know. And, and I say, hold on, I'll text George. No and, way. And, and George will text me back. Yeah. Oh. So somebody asked me one time, so. There, there are these pictures of John Paul II wearing glasses as a young priest, right? And, and, and so somebody asked me this question. So, but you never saw him wearing glasses as Pope. So, what, did he wear contacts or what? And so I texted George, and he wrote me back, and he said that John Paul needed glasses as a young man, and as he got older, his eyesight actually improved, and he didn't need the glasses anymore. But dude, dude, you gotta oh, get. George you got, would know that. But you gotta. Maybe somehow he would be on my radio show. I, I, I wouldn't be worthy of interviewing him. But man, maybe somehow you could, <laughs> you could get him on my. I mean, email email him and me at the same time and see if he would let me talk to him for now. I wouldn't uh, even uh, talk to him. I would connect. just turn on the microphone. I'll connect. I've, I've uh, read. Uh, I've read one and a half of his books on John. John. Paul, one of us is quite done. His books are like this. Yeah, thick. yeah, and you know, and I always am reading multiple books at the same time. So at some point. I got halfway through a book. I don't, and I didn't finish. I don't know. It's sitting out there on my reading stack still, but yeah, what an honor that would be. And so, yeah, so, 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 so George, George and, and Christopher West, they both helped me to kind of synthesize this list of the top things that John, John Paul gave us. So in that top 10 list, we already talked about the luminous mysteries, the theology of the body, uh, world youth day, the catechism of the Catholic church, uh, and devotion to Mary, uh, the fall of communism. So, oh, uh, so uh, I'll get to I'll get to the top one in a second, but well, we we're running out of time, it. so you better jam through this one. I'll jam through this one. So the, there's a book called The Pope and the President, John mm-hmm. Paul II, Ronald Reagan, their collaboration, both spiritually and and in actual um, um, politi- po- po- politics is the wrong word um, yeah. diplomacy okay. to, to to bring down the the Iron Curtain. A fascinating book. So Paul Kingor wrote that book, and he actually wrote the the foreword to my book. And so we talk about how John Paul and Ronald Reagan brought about the collapse of communism. It's so true. It's a fascinating, fascinating. I've read, I've read through some of George's writing on that. No, you got one more minute. Tell us what the uh, other one, one, one you want. The yeah. top, the top one, the the, the number one is 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 the new evangelization. Amen. Paul the sixth said that the church exists to evangelize. That's why God, why Jesus founded the church, to, to bring the good news to the whole world. John Paul put a, a laser-like focus on evangelization, on preaching the word, and, and, and new in order and methods. And this is what we're doing today. We are, we are aren't we? We are, you and me, everyone. Right yeah. The, la- the laity, what, yeah. The la- empowering the laity to walk with the clergy in bringing Jesus to the world. But you know and how they go. 
And you know that, how... that, that was the whole focus. Everything that John Paul did was focused on the new evangelization. World Youth Day, the catechism, the rosary, all of this leads to... Praise God. To the body. It all leads to the evangelization of but, the you know, world. And, and that's the charism you and I live under, is that, that I know there's a certain charism I can't explain that we're that I'm operating under with, with our ministry. You know, there's that this saying, Mary had a little lamb and never became a sheep. He got involved in the new evangelization and died of lack of sleep. Do you ever feel like that? You know? <laughs> it's, like, it's just so much on our plate. We're talking with Patrick Novakowski. Uh, you got to read his new book, 100 Ways John Paul to Change the World. You can find him at novamedia.us. Thank you, Patrick. The book Patrick. is on Amazon and, um, and our Sunday Visitor bookstore. Really? Is it an Our Sunday? Who, who published it's, it? Our Sunday Visitor? Our, our Sunday Visitor published my book. Yes. They like you so much, they published your book. I know, right? I know. One of my books, I went, I sent it to him the gun. Now we, we're not going to publish it. I, of course, Franciscan Media did, but I mean, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, I, I dig on. I, I, they, if you're with them, I know it's a great, they have a great reputation and I know it's a great book. So we'll have to have you back on to talk about some of the other things in another time. Patrick, thank you for joining us. Until next week. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You can watch this uh, on YouTube if you want to by going to the Bear Wozniak YouTube channel. May the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Hey, man. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Plus, good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell.